Welcome to the second section of Chapter 1, General Principles. In this section, I will be discussing many of the important receptors and signaling pathways that you'll need to know for Step 1. Let's get started. This is Table 1.1, which provides a list of some of the important second messenger pathways. From this table, you need to remember that there are two pathways. First, the GQ alpha subunit pathway, which regulates IP3 and DAG. And second, the GS and the GI alpha subunit pathways. And these both regulate cyclic AMP. We'll go through each of these pathways more in a second. Okay, before we move on, notice that there are many receptors that are associated with G proteins. For example, H1, alpha-1, V1, etc. are associated with the GQ alpha subunit pathway. These can be difficult to memorize, so some students use the mnemonic have one m and m to help recall this information. So H A V M M. Notice that all of the receptors except the last muscarinic receptor contain the number one, and then M3 right here. There are also several hormones associated with this pathway, which you can see right here. Students also use the mnemonic MAD2s to remember the GI alpha subunit pathway. By using these mnemonics, you can get most questions right by process of elimination and deduce what receptors use the GS alpha subunit pathway. Okay, one last note about these pathways. Because they require several steps and usually are associated with the transcription of proteins, these pathways are typically slow acting. Contrast this with ligand gated channels, which typically are associated with an immediate response. Okay, with this in mind, let's go through each of these pathways. This is figure 1.8, which outlines the normal GQ alpha subunit pathway. This is the extracellular space and the intracellular space. And this is the G protein coupled receptor. Notice how the receptor interacts with or is coupled to the GQ alpha subunit right here, which is bound to GDP. However, the alpha subunit is just one part of the G protein. The G protein is also comprised of the beta and the gamma subunits. When a ligand binds to the receptor, the receptor undergoes a conformational change, which causes the GQ alpha subunit to exchange GDP for GTP. The GQ alpha subunit then dissociates from the receptor and the other subunits in order to bind phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is an enzyme that cleaves PIP2 into IP3 and DAG. We can see from the image that IP3 binds to the endoplasmic reticulum, causing it to release calcium. Calcium and DAG then cause activation of protein kinase C, which is ultimately responsible for the cellular response. Okay, so we just covered the GQ alpha subunit pathway. Again, the pathway activates IP3 and DAG, which ultimately cause activation of protein kinase C. Okay, now let's go through the GS and the GI alpha subunit pathways. This is figure 1.9, which outlines the normal GS and GI alpha subunit second messenger pathways. This is the extracellular space, and this is the intracellular space. And this is the G protein coupled receptor right here. Again, notice how the receptor interacts with, or is coupled to, the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. The alpha subunit is bound to GDP, and in this figure, we haven't labeled the alpha subunit, GS or GI specifically, because they behave opposite to one another. However, both the GS and the GI alpha subunits regulate this pathway. So we could say this is the GS or the GI alpha subunit, depending on the next step in the pathway. For step one, you need to know that the GS pathway causes activation of cyclic AMP, and the GI pathway causes inhibition of cyclic AMP. So the GS pathway stimulates this, and the GI pathway inhibits this. 
Okay, with this in mind, let's assume this pathway is depicting the GS alpha subunit pathway. So when a ligand binds to the receptor, draw that right here, the receptor undergoes a conformational change, you can see that right here, which causes the GS alpha subunit to exchange GDP for GTP. So GDP right here has been exchanged for GTP. The GS alpha subunit then dissociates from the receptor and the other subunits in order to bind adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is an enzyme that converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then activates protein kinase A, also known as PKA. And PKA phosphorylates other enzymes within the cell, which is ultimately responsible for the cellular response. So again, the GS alpha subunit pathway causes cyclic AMP levels to increase, and the GI alpha subunit pathway causes cyclic AMP levels to decrease. Okay, now let's talk about receptors associated with cyclic GMP. There are four ligands that regulate the cyclic GM pathway. These include atrial natriuretic peptide, brain natriuretic peptide, nitric oxide, and endothelial-derived relaxing factor. These ligands regulate the enzyme guanylate cyclase, which converts GTP into cyclic GMP, which then activates protein kinase G. So GTP gets converted to cyclic GMP, which activates protein kinase G, and ultimately, the activation of guanylate cyclase results in vascular smooth muscle relaxation. Let's pull up a figure to make this clear. This is figure 1.10, which outlines the normal second messenger pathway involving cyclic GMP. This is the extracellular space and the intracellular space. This second messenger system is a little unique because there are two pathways you need to be familiar with. The intracellular receptor pathway and the extracellular receptor pathway. In the intracellular pathway, the amino acid arginine or exogenous drugs can be converted into nitric oxide, so NO. The nitric oxide diffuses across the plasma membrane and stimulates cytosolic guanylate cyclase. And this is an enzyme which converts GTP into cyclic GMP. In the extracellular pathway, a ligand such as atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, can bind to the associated receptor. In this case, ANP would bind to the ANP receptor. The receptor is directly associated with guanylate cyclase, so we call this an intrinsic guanylate cyclase. So it may be best to depict this as if these are somehow connected. This enzyme performs the same function as cytosolic guanylate cyclase, which converts GTP into cyclic GMP. As you can see, both pathways stimulate a guanylate cyclase which ultimately produces cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP activates protein kinase G, or PKG, which results in vasodilation. Okay, let's move on to a few other signaling pathways and then go through some questions. Okay, the next topic is steroid hormone receptors. Ligands that bind to these receptors include androgens, estrogens, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and progesterone. While thyroid hormones and fat-soluble vitamins are not considered steroids, they act very similar to steroid hormones by binding to intracellular or nuclear receptors. So there's not a figure for this pathway, but just remember that steroids and steroid-like molecules bind to intracellular and intranuclear receptors, which ultimately regulate transcription. Okay, let's move on to the receptor tyrosine kinases. Ligands that bind to receptor tyrosine kinases include insulin, insulin-like growth factor 1, epidermal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, and fibroblast growth factor. For step 1, you need to know that ligands that bind to receptor tyrosine kinases ultimately regulate the RAS MAP kinase pathway. Let's pull up a figure so you can see what this looks like. This is figure 1.11 from your text, which shows a receptor tyrosine kinase, sometimes abbreviated RTK. And RTK acts as a receptor and also has an intracellular enzymatic function. 
This enzymatic portion contains the amino acid tyrosine. More specifically, the enzymatic portion of the RTK acts as a kinase, hence the name receptor tyrosine kinase. We can see the intrinsic kinase domain right here. So when a ligand binds to an RTK, you can see that right here, it causes neighboring RTKs to come in close proximity with one another. From the figure, we can see that the RTKs are closer together right here. The RTKs can then phosphorylate the neighboring RTK. Notice that the receptor complex now has several phosphorus groups attached. In this state, the RTK combined to another protein called an SH2 adapter protein. This complex can then activate a protein called RAS. RAS is a GTPase, which means it can convert GTP into GDP. And ultimately, RAS can activate MAP kinase, which causes further downstream cellular regulation. So remember, RTKs act on the RAS MAP kinase pathway. OK, now let's look at non-receptor tyrosine kinases. Ligands that bind to non-receptor tyrosine kinases include immunomodulators, such as IL-2 and IL-6, prolactin, thrombopoietin, erythropoietin, growth hormone, and granulocyte colony stimulating factor. For step one, you need to know that ligands that bind to non-receptor tyrosine kinases ultimately regulate the JAK-STAT pathway. Let's pull up a figure so you can see what this looks like. This is figure 1.12 from your text, which shows a non-receptor tyrosine kinase, or NRTK. An NRTK acts as a receptor, but does not have intrinsic kinase activity, hence the name non-receptor tyrosine kinase. Instead, NRTKs are associated with a cytoplasmic protein called Janus kinase, or JAK, which is responsible for the kinase activity. So this is the cytoplasmic tyrosine kinase, also known as JAK. So when a ligand binds to the NRTK receptor, you can see that right here, a conformational change attracts cytoplasmic JAK to the intracellular component of the NRTK receptor. So we can see that right here. The JAK is important because it contains the kinase enzymatic function that is responsible for the phosphorylation of the JAK proteins and the intracellular portion of the receptors, as you can see right here. Once the complex is phosphorylated, it can then attract STAT proteins. STAT stands for signal transducer and activator of transcription. STAT proteins are then phosphorylated and translocate into the nucleus where they alter transcription. So we can see that this is phosphorylated, and then it will go into the nucleus. So remember, NRTKs act on the JAK-STAT pathway. OK, with this in mind, let's do some questions. A two-year-old girl presents with a five-week history of intense coughing. The physician notices a deep cough on expiration. How will the patient's intracellular signaling most likely be altered as a result of the underlying abnormality? OK, hopefully from the question stem, you notice that the girl has had a cough for five weeks. And she also has a deep cough on expiration. This is a pretty classic description of pertussis. Recall from microbiology that pertussis produces an exotoxin, which inhibits the GI alpha subunit. As I described earlier, the GI alpha subunit pathway normally inhibits the production of cyclic AMP. So GI normally causes decreased cyclic AMP. So if pertussis inhibits the GI alpha subunit pathway, then we can see that cyclic AMP levels would rise. The abnormal disruption of this pathway is responsible for the inhibition of phagocytosis, which is why pertussis can survive inside the patient for such a long period of time. So how will the intracellular signaling be altered? The GI alpha subunit pathway will be inhibited, resulting in a rise in levels of cyclic AMP. OK, so this is figure 1.9. And recall that when the alpha subunit is the GI alpha subunit, it inhibits 
adenylate cyclase. So cyclic AMP levels would be decreased. In this case, pertussis, we'll do P for short, inhibits this process, resulting in a rise in cyclic AMP. Okay, let's do another question. A 16-year-old male presents to the emergency department after abusing his sister's insulin. The physician administers a load of glucose and then injects a drug that normally causes increased gluconeogenesis. This likely drug acts on what second messenger pathway? Okay, from the question stem, we know that the patient is abusing insulin, and a drug was given to counteract the effects of insulin. Recall that glucagon opposes insulin, and the administration of glucose and glucagon can be very helpful in restoring the patient's blood glucose levels to normal. As we learned earlier, glucagon normally acts on the GS alpha subunit pathway, which increases cyclic AMP. So glucagon acts on the GS alpha subunit pathway, which increases cyclic AMP. So again, this is figure 1.9, and if this is the GS alpha subunit, then this would cause stimulation of adenylate cyclase. So if we upregulate this through glucagon, then cyclic AMP levels would rise. Okay, let's do another question. A 55-year-old male with a six-month history of stable angina has been prescribed a drug that can relieve acute episodes of chest pain by altering a second messenger pathway. What drug has been prescribed and what is the mechanism of action? Okay, so this patient has stable angina and is given a drug that is helpful in relieving chest pain. Recall that nitroglycerin is a common drug used for stable angina. Nitroglycerin gets converted into nitric oxide, which can then act on the second messenger pathway involving cyclic GMP. So normally, this increases cyclic GMP, which causes vasodilation, resulting in decreased preload, do P for short. The decreased preload on the heart is helpful in relieving the pain because the heart doesn't have to pump as much blood, so it doesn't have to work as hard. From figure 1.10, we can see that nitric oxide stimulates guanylate cyclase, which produces cyclic GMP, which ultimately causes vasodilation. Okay, let's do another question. A 32-year-old male returned from Africa two days ago and presents with complaints of watery diarrhea. Stool examination reveals gram-negative organisms that are flagellated and grow in an alkaline environment. What signaling pathway is likely disrupted, resulting in the watery diarrhea? Okay, so a history of traveling, diarrhea, and gram-negative flagellated organisms should make you think of Vibrio cholerae. Recall from microbiology that Vibrio cholerae produces cholera toxin, which overactivates cyclic AMP in the gut. The overactive cyclic AMP causes chloride and water to be excreted in excess within the lumen of the GI tract, which ultimately pulls water into the lumen and is responsible for the watery diarrhea. So Vibrio cholerae produces cholera toxin, which increases the GS alpha subunit pathway, resulting in increased cyclic AMP, resulting in increased chloride and water excretion into the gut, resulting in watery diarrhea. From figure 1.9, you can see that the GS alpha subunit normally increases the stimulation of adenylate cyclase. So activation of this pathway through the cholera toxin will result in increased cyclic AMP. Okay, let's do another question. A 68-year-old female presents with a two-week history of intense itching and burning after her weekly routine of exercising at the pool and sitting in the hot tub. What intracellular signaling pathway is abnormally activated? From the question stem, we know that the patient experiences itching and burning after being in the hot tub. This is a pretty unique finding that should make you think of polycythemia vera. So PV is a type of hematopoietic cancer that results in excess production of red blood cells. I remember that erythropoietin normally is responsible for the production of red blood cells, so a mutation in the pathway associated with erythropoietin 
should result in the excess production of red blood cells. PV is caused by mutations in the JAK-STAT pathway, specifically the JAK2 kinase protein. So PV results in increased activation of the JAK2 protein. This results in increased activation of STAT. From figure 1.13, we can see that overactivation of JAK will cause overactivation of STAT. Okay, let's do one more question. A 19-year-old male is taking anabolic steroids for muscle growth. Where within the cell does this drug likely act? Okay, pretty straightforward. Remember, all steroids and steroid-like molecules bind to intracellular and intranuclear receptors that ultimately regulate transcription. Because this patient is taking anabolic steroids, we can assume that the drug is ultimately regulating transcription at the nucleus. So steroids bind to intracellular and intranuclear receptors, which regulates transcription at the nucleus.